Well, it turns out that she was part of, the way she got the idea of doing this product was she was out there consulting with companies, helping them solve their problem. So she had a revenue base from her consulting business. And I said, you know what, I think you can probably pull this off just leveraging from your consulting business into a software and services business. And that's what she did. Now, I did go on her board, okay? And I was on her board for 15 years. And I got a few stock options, and it was great. It was great fun. And uh, she, her company was ultimately acquired by um, E-Trade for over $100 million, her and her partner, when that, when that ended. And, and she had, other than the stock options she granted to her employees and the board, she was able to maintain well over the majority control of the company. And that, that's a great example of just kind of figuring out how to muster your resources and, and do it. Rob told you about Comply. Uh, I, uh, Rob asked me to look at Comply recently. And it, it said it's another great all-American story of a couple really sacrificing and working hard and being determined and not giving up. And, and, and they're going to build a great company, I think. And it's, just, it's another bootstrapping. Now, now they're at a place where the, the, their business is ready to accelerate. And yeah, they don't have all the cash resources to help invest to make it go. But that's a nice time to be raising money when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're in that situation. Whoops. OK, the next thing are called the three Fs. You may have heard this. Friends, family, and fools. And this is also a very common way to fund your business, and for good reason again. Well, you know, friends, those are people you know. Those are people who believe in you. Okay? I mean, that's certainly better than a stranger. Family, likewise, you know? The, the, and this, is, this happens all the time. Now, the reason we say fools is, they don't know any better. <laughs> so, and, and it's really just meant to be a little bit cute here, but sometimes they don't really know what they're getting into. I mean, they may be well-intended, but they don't really understand business. They don't understand what you're trying to do. They have no idea if that you're going to make money. They don't know how to ask the right questions. They don't know how to help you. They don't know how, to, how they're going to get their money back. So that's, that's, so it's a very, what we mean by a fool is a relatively unsophisticated investor. Obviously, there's money there, but um, maybe, but I, I, I don't think it's generally a, a good way to go. Angels. Well, who are angels? Well, an angel isn't somebody that comes down from heaven and drops a big wad of money on your doorstep. I can assure you of that. So the angels are people actually like Rob. I've, I've played an angel, been an angel. I think Dan, who's going to come up after me, has been an angel. And we're not necessarily professional investors. In other words, we don't make a living necessarily. We don't have a fund. We don't have, we're not a bank. You know, we're not, we're not a venture capital firm where we have funds allocated and we're always out there turning them over. But we, but, but people who have generally been successful, obviously they have to have some money and they have an interest and they usually, um, it, you, sometimes it happens later in career like has happened with me you know, where, where you get involved in businesses and it's kind of fun to help somebody and see something grow and so on and so forth. And that's a very, very, very common and very, very valid way of getting uh, money. And that happens through networks. You're not, there are some formal angel organizations out there, by the way. So, you know, depending on, on uh, how, how far you might want to reach out for money, there are, there are organizations in different parts of the country of, of people who meet regularly, review business plans, and decide uh, on, on, on what to fund, and et cetera. So that's another source. The banks in the Small Business Administration. Less likely that a startup or a smaller business is going to get funding this way. Certainly not, not it's certainly doable. Okay, but usually the, ba the banks aren't major risk takers. They want to finance something that, that is, and I don't mean anything negative about the banks, but you know, they're, they're, they're investing other people's money and, and they're not, they, they expect it to come back, I mean, for sure. And so uh, the banks can be valuable though in certain situations, you know, depending on your structure, your asset base, what you're trying to finance. Maybe you're trying to just get financing for a large contract that you've already got 
locked up and you just need to bridge a gap and, it, and, and you're gonna pay it back fairly soon when you collect your, your contract. In some cases, you know, the SBA, the Small Business Administration, will, will fund, and maybe somebody here has done that and they could tell us about that later, that would be great. You know, will we'll, uh, uh, guarantee a loan for a bank, that's what they do. They try to help, you know, they try to help the creation of small business, so you can submit a plan, there's a lot of paperwork, there's red tape, but is, is it a viable source of financing? Absolutely. And, and if you have something and you have the, you know, you, you might want to try that. Customers and vendors. Well, I think you already heard that from Rob as well. Um, if you have something of real value, don't underestimate what a customer can do for you. Or vi vice versa, if you are procuring something from a vendor that's helping them with their business, there, there, may, be, there may be some synergy there. Now, I'm not talking about just borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, you, you don't pay your vendor and you ask for your customer to pay you in advance. I mean, you can do that. That's cash management. Everybody does it. But I, I don't mean that really. I mean a synergistic deal, okay? A deal that truly, it's, it's good for both parties. And there's definitely opportunities uh, for that. And you need to kind of just take your situation and see, hey, is that possible in my business? And if you're really strapped and you need some capital, that's, that's a possibility. Traditional venture capitalists. Well, those, you know, the environment I came from, Silicon Valley, is famous for that, you know, and, and there, there's other places throughout the country. You know, they are very formal, very tough, very uh, picky. They demand a lot, um, and they get a lot. I mean, i give you an example. Um, a traditional venture capitalist um, can be a great source of financing, but typically right, off, right out of the box, you probably lost control of your business, in other words, as a percentage of ownership. That's not necessarily bad, but I mean, you just under, have to understand that, okay? They look at probably a thousand deals at least, I'd say at a minimum, for every one that gets funded. For every one that gets, for every, for those one, that one that's funded, if you take 10 of them, maybe one of them becomes successful. That's the odds in the venture capital business. And we all hear about these wonderful things, you know, somebody invested in eBay. And obviously it happens every day, it's great. But let me tell you, the odds, they're out for big returns. They're investing insurance company money, institutional money to get big, big returns, 10 to 20 times return on their money. So the filtering process, the vetting process, as somebody mentioned earlier, is, is very significant. They do it very well, okay? Uh, and it's hard to make it through the filter. But it's, it's certainly worthwhile sometimes if you can do it, because they help create great companies. And then, of course, lastly, if you're lucky enough to ultimately get access to the public market, you know, the public market is, a, is the ultimate liquidity event, that or an acquisition, you know, having the company acquired. But at that at IPO, you're still running the company. Acquisition, you're kind of probably gone. So those, those, that's, that's, that's the range of capital. And I'd say, really, most people are faced with the, I'd say, the top three and even the top two more than anything, you know? And you've probably had that experience already. Okay, now, if you are going to get an investor involved in your business, it's very important to understand there are different kinds of investors, okay? Not all investors are the same. There's, in my view, and trying to simplify this, there are two types of investors. There are investors who, who want to be, who are income oriented. In other words, they give you a dollar, and they expect over the course of a, uh, uh, every month some amount of money back, a penny a month back or something like that, you know, okay? They're income-oriented investors. They, so they're looking to share in the operating profits of your business. Now your business may be such that it's very well attuned to that. Let's say, I mean a simple example would be, you know, you got a bunch of apartment buildings and you're looking for how to finance it and you can't get the money from from a, a, under a mortgage or a bank or something, but the, the, thing, the thing pencils out on cash flow, so if you had the money, you could show them that you're gonna be able to, to pay them back regularly. 
that, that might be uh, one, one example. The, uh, the business plan, of course, has, whatever the business is, uh, has to be geared to be profitable pretty quickly because these people are expecting a return. They're, they're, they're looking for the income. How, how I want that money every month. And so it puts a different demand on how you structure your business and, and what you have to achieve. Now then, then there's the equity-oriented investor, totally different mindset. They're investing in you as an owner. They take an ownership position. They take part of your skin. Again, not bad, but for good reason. You know, they're going at risk. They, they, they may not have any security whatsoever. An income-oriented investor, in some cases, may have security. So if the whole thing doesn't work out, they don't lose 100% of their investment. An equity investor is at, totally at the bottom of the pile in terms of the creditors, so they're most at risk. And they, of course, are looking to make money when the company gets taken public or it gets sold, acquired or sold. Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a future liquidity event that gets their, gets their money back. Now, I don't know, again, about the makeup in this room, you know, how many people have businesses that are geared to do that versus the top. You know, the top, a lot of people, they have businesses because they want to generate an income for themselves, their family. It's an ongoing thing that the idea is not to sell it down the road. Or, you know, there's diff different, different approaches here. And the business plan for an equity or an investor is quite different. It, and it really has to address how do you get out of the business? What happens? Obviously, an IPO is great. The business goes on. The, the value goes up, hopefully, from the, from the uh, liquidity event, et cetera. But if, if that isn't feasible in the plan, you, you, I mean, think about it. If, somebody, if you go to somebody and say, I want you to invest in my business, and you're asking them for an equity investment, how the heck are they going to get their money back? I mean, you, you may make enough money where someday you can pay them back, and then they're gonna, you know, and then with, on what basis? What are they, what, what are those terms gonna be, okay? Now, what do they look for? Well, if you're starting out like this guy on the right, which says, don't call that company, they might not give me a great reference right now. Uh, you're really behind the eight ball. So, I can assure you from all of my experience, which was, you know, 35 years in Silicon Valley, and knowing a lot of VCs and other investors, other types of investors, they look for people, people, and people. You heard it from Rob. If it wasn't for him and his team, they might not have reconfigured their strategy and come up with a new product to, 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 set, to ultimately build the, what, what Ascend became. The investors invested in them smartly but they saw something. They wouldn't have done that. They wouldn't have given the second chance or the third chance. So it helps, obviously, to have a track record. It helps to have a strong team. Doesn't mean every player of the company, every member of the management team has to be on board, but it certainly helps. 